So given all of those challenges, if you're sitting today as Secretary of State and you're looking at certain global hotspots, you're looking at a world that's kind of turning upside down, that's kind of inverting. And the way that you try to go about dealing with global hotspots has a lot of uncertainty in it that wouldn't have even been there for me when I was Secretary of State. So let's take a couple of the global hotspots and then we'll get to Q&A. So the first of the global hotspots, let's talk about North Korea. Right? So North Korea. Um, I was probably, I think I was the last Secretary of State before Rex Tillerson and Mike Pompeo who tried to negotiate with the North Koreans. It was the father, not the son. But what's the challenge? The challenge is you have an isolated, completely opaque country that you wouldn't think about for one half second on any given day, except, except that it has nuclear weapons programs that look like it's about to create a nuclear weapon capable of reaching the western coast, the west coast of the United States. Just think about it, without that point, you would not think about the North Koreans because you basically have American forces in Korea that deter any kind of conventional attack by the North Koreans. So why does anybody think about North Koreans? It's that nuclear thing with North Korea. By the way, you also have a country that has essentially no assets. So what do they sell? It turns out they sell uh, American, uh, uh, forged American dollars, they sell cigarettes, and they sell nuclear materials. That's their trade. So you wake up and you think, how am I gonna deal with this country? The three things you always ask about any policy situation when you're in a policy um, role is the first, and people sometimes don't understand how important this is, who else can I get to come along and help? No American Secretary of State actually wants to do this all by themselves. The problem is the Secretary of State is like the 911 for the world. So if there's a problem, somebody's going to call the American Secretary of State and say, fix this for me. And you want to say, what part are you going to play in fixing this? The only country in the world, by the way, that never did that was Australia. They would actually call and say, we got this. There's a problem in the Marshall Islands. We've got this. She used to love to take calls from the Australian foreign minister. <laughs> Everybody else, what are you going to do about it? So the first thing you ask is, who else can help here? Right, we'll come back to that on North Korea. The second problem, the second question that you always ask is, what tools do I have? Right? And then, of course, you ask, what am I trying to achieve? Right. Now, with North Korea, the who else might help is kind of complicated, right? Because uh, there are not too many that can help. The South Koreans can help a little bit, but you don't want the South Koreans to help to the point that they actually might make a deal with the North Koreans that would not be good for stability on the, on the Korean Peninsula. So you have to be a little bit careful with how you deal with the South Koreans in this. Uh, the Japanese can't really help because they've got the world's worst relations with the North Koreans. Uh, you may have read about this thing with comfort women and so forth and so on. Uh, Japan doesn't have a very good reputation still in most of Asia, and so North Korea, uh, the, the J Japanese can only be of so much help. The Russians, not so much. They can mostly be harmful, so you're basically trying to keep them at bay. And then, of course, there, the Ch there's the Chinese. They can help a lot. But of course, the problem with the Chinese is that the way that they would help isn't a way that they're willing to help. Why? Because they would have to put so much pressure on the North Korean regime. China accounts for 93% of the trade with North Korea. They'd have to put a lot of pressure on the North Korean regime. And what's the danger to China? That the North Korean regime collapses as a result. And now what have they produced? They've produced a circumstance in which the North Korean regime collapses and American forces are on their border. 
And oh, by the way, we haven't helped ourselves because, of course, we unified Germany totally and completely on our terms. Right thing to do, but people remember that. So China will only help so much. So that's your answer there. China will only help so much. And you can do it in different ways. I decided when I was secretary that we would create something called the six party talks. We would actually put China in the chair. And then we would have Russia, Japan, South Korea, the United States, and North Korea when they were behaving at the table so we could get everybody's interest aligned. So you need to figure out how you're going to deal with the international dimension of the problem. That's the first thing. Second thing is, uh, what tools do I have? Well, um, if I really am worried that North Korea might create a nuclear weapon that can reach the territory of the United States, it's quite possible that I'm willing to go to war to stop that. And one of the things that President Trump had going for him that others, other presidents didn't is they're getting close enough to that capability that when the American president says, I might go to war to stop that, people believe him. So you might consider military force, but of course the problem with using military force on the Korean Peninsula is that you, might, you will win, but South Korea will be obliterated in the meantime. So military force you want to use uh, in a rather more gradual way, maybe just to signal or the like. You have as a tool sanctions, but only to the degree that you can get others to agree to the sanctions, which is one reason we formed the six party talks, because we figured if we could get everybody aligned, maybe we could get strong sanctions on the North Koreans. But you might also try carrots. You might say, what can I hold out for the North Koreans that they might actually want to do this? That's what President Trump is trying to play. And so I remember when he first uh, agreed to meet with Kim Jong-un and I thought, oh no, what's he doing? And then, you know, nothing else has worked, okay? So maybe you give it a try. Uh, first time, probably a good idea. Second time, maybe not so much a good idea. Uh, third time, probably really not a good idea. But they're trying to find a series of incentives as opposed to punishments to get the North Koreans to change course. Then finally, what are you trying to do? We, the Obama administration, the Clinton administration, and President Trump have all set the total denuclearization of the North Koreans. Now, it may well be that the total denuclearization of North Korea is not achievable. And so you have to ask yourself, and I'm not giving you an answer, I'm just saying it's a question you ask, am I prepared to, choose to accept something less along the way hoping that perhaps by the time we get to a certain point, the North Korean regime collapses or becomes something different or whatever, but I can, can freeze their program long enough. That was the debate, by the way, about the Iranian nuclear deal. Right? So you, you set a goal out here, but now you have to ask yourself, how realistic that I'm going to get, to get there in one fell swoop, and what do I do along the way? So that's how you would frame the North Korean situation. You don't get to sit as Secretary of State and say, oh my god, there's a global hotspot. Right? You actually have to have a strategy for dealing with it. And it drives you a little bit crazy when you're reading in the newspapers, uh, people are saying, the world, you know, the columnist, the world should come together around a policy on North Korea. Do you think, why didn't I think of that? You know? <laughs> So there's a difference between those who write about it and those who have to actually do it. <laughs>